the morning. If you have a copy of God's Word, open it to Galatians 3. We'll be in Galatians 3. I want to start reading in verse 10 this morning. And we'll read through verse 26. Paul writing to the churches of Galatia and under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit writes this for all who rely on works of the law are under a curse for it is written cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. To give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to his, or to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. This is what I mean. The law, which came 430 years afterward, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise, <clears throat> but God gave it to Abraham by a promise. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made, and it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now, an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Now, before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would allow us, Lord, to continue in worship this morning through the preaching of your word and that you would grant understanding and that you would convince us of your truth, of your word, the veracity of scripture, the veracity of your promises. Convince us of the promises of God. Convince us of the gospel. Convince us of the glory of and majesty of Jesus Christ, our Savior, the Messiah. Drive us to worship in greater ways, Lord, I pray. Guard your people from anything that I may say accidentally in error, as I'm a fallible man, but your word, Lord, is infallible and inerrant, and we pray, Lord, that it would be um, the source of our truth. And we just pray that you would bless our time together now, and we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. There are uh, two primary covenants, as, as, as we see in this passage. Uh, I'm, I read a long chunk of passage, and you'll remember two weeks ago, um, I had this sermon, trying to prepare a sermon for the whole passage, and it didn't work. Um, so I had to extract a, 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 a sermon. And then studying this week, I'm still not going to handle this whole passage We'll get to it uh, next week, parts of it next week too, but I want to look at, at part of this passage tonight or this morning, and as you work through, it's, it's impossible to take just the first few verses because down in the ending verses that we read this morning, there's things that are pertaining to 
previous verses. So um, I want us to look this morning at the promises to Abraham. And, and there are two primary covenants. There, there is the covenant of works between God and man that we know God gave Adam in, in the garden at creation. <clears throat> we've, we've spoken of that. Um, you can go back and look at Genesis, um, the creation where God gives, them, gives Adam everything and it's under his dominion as we see in Psalm 8. Um, and then he says, what? Obey and live, disobey and, and die. The, the day that you eat of the fruit which is in disobedience to me, you will surely die. And we know through Scripture um, Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden and the result was humanity fell under condemnation. We have all fallen under a sin nature, the Bible teaches us. So we, so we have this covenant of works that we see in the opening chapters of Genesis, the covenant between God and man that we have all also broken and subsequently are under the condemnation of the law as we talked about last time because Romans 8, 1 tells us this wonderful truth that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And the implication of that is that those who are not in Christ are what? Under condemnation, right? <clears throat> but God instituted another covenant, and we know that as the covenant of grace. God introduced this covenant in Genesis 3 in seed form as the gracious promise to redeem a people unto himself. And ever since that promise in, of grace in Genesis 3, God has been unfolding in greater detail how this covenant of grace would be fulfilled, while at the same time reminding us that the covenant of works has been broken. Now, last time we looked at a question about the law. Paul says in verse 19, why then the law? Right? Good question. When, when you're reading what Paul's explaining, when Paul's uh, arguing against what the false teachers are promoting. And so it's a good question. Paul assumes that question is going to come from the false teachers. Why then the law? Why the Mosaic Covenant? In other words, are you telling us that God put into place the law of Moses, the Mosaic Covenant, and it plays no role in the salvation of men? And Paul says, no, that's not true. You'll notice that the Paul, Paul like anticipates the questions being like at the knee-jerk reaction, always pendulum swings to the farthest side, right? And so, in other words, are you, why then the law? I mean, are you telling me that God put in the Mosaic Covenant and it plays no role in the salvation of men? And so Paul tells us that it does serve a purpose in the salvation of men. But it is not the means. It, it is not the salvation. Does that make sense? It's not the salvation, but it does play a role in the salvation of men. And we looked at that a couple of weeks ago. We answered that question last time. What is the purpose of the law of Moses? And there were three truths I just want to remind us of because it ties in with what Paul is saying here that we're going to look at this morning. Three truths regarding God's purposes for the law of Moses. And you'll find this in verse 19 <clears throat> through 25. Number one, to convict of sin. It was put in place, Paul says, because of transgressions. Okay, so Paul, said, Paul tells us here that the, the primary purpose of the law was to convict of sin. And he, he, he uses a term here, schoolmaster. Maybe your, your translation says guardian. <clears throat> but that role is to keep in front of us that we're sinners in need of grace and in need of redemption. <clears throat> we need a Messiah. We need someone who can stand in our stead in the courtroom of God because we have no righteousness to offer, and the law is constantly teaching me that I have no righteousness to offer God, to present myself in the courtroom of God. And so it was primarily given to convict of sin. <clears throat> It was also temporary in nature, and Paul tells us that it was our guardian until Christ came. And now we're no longer, since Christ came, under that guardian. So it was temporary in nature. It was a covenant of preparation, if you will. I said that a couple of weeks ago. It was a covenant of preparation to prepare us 
for the faith revealed in Jesus Christ. And once the promised Messiah came, it was no longer necessary. It was a covenant of preparation. And it was also intended by God to point to our need of Jesus. It was to convict us of sin, to keep our sin before us all the time, never with the purpose of us never putting our hope in self-righteousness. Right? Don't put your hope in self-righteousness. Don't put your hope in the sacrifices. Put your hope in God. Put your hope in the promised seed that's going to come and redeem us from the sin that we've given into and commit all the time and fallen into. And look to Jesus. Be prepared for Jesus, the one to come. And so to the objections of the false teachers and the natural, the natural, I think, inquiry of the Galatians, Paul says, yes, the law has purpose for salvation. It was to show our sin, to convict us of sin, to point us and prepare us for the Messiah, and it was temporary in nature. <clears throat> now, I want to start out this morning by looking at what Paul says in verse 21. He answers, he anticipates and answers a, a second question. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God. Paul says, certainly not. And then he says, for if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. And this is very important to understand. <clears throat> when the New Testament reveals that circumcision is no longer required, the Mosaic covenant has been fulfilled and is no longer necessary, when God gives Peter a vision that all kinds of meat are clean to eat, <clears throat> There's naturally going to be an inquiry as to why. So Paul answers a potential objection to the doctrine of justification by faith alone. Is the law evil if it only condemns? Right? That's what he's anticipating. Is, the con is it contrary to the promise of salvation? Is, is that the law? And Paul says, certainly not. The law is not evil. Matter of fact, the weakness of the law is not the law. But our inability to keep it. And that's what Paul says. If a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. The weakness of the law is not the law. The weakness of the law is our inability to keep it. Listen to this. The law is only words and rules. It can only inject the idea of behavior into the mind of a person. It can only demand, demand that each precept be kept and obeyed. The law is mere words, cold and lifeless. It is entirely external to man, outside the body of man. It has no spirit, no life, no power to enable a person to do the law. Paul has answered the question of why the law. Now Paul is answering the, the weakness of the law, which is really a weakness in us. And it needs to be understood, and, and Paul is saying this here, that the Mosaic covenant is not a covenant of works. It is not a covenant of works. There's not a law that can give life. It is not a covenant in which God is saying, be perfect and live. That's the covenant of works in Genesis. He's not saying here, we're, we're going to start over and here's an, a covenant of works. And if you do this, you'll live as if obedience to the law of Moses was somehow God offering an altern alternate way other than the promised Messiah to become righteous in God's eyes. Remember what Paul said, if righteousness can come through the law, then who died in vain? Christ. God would never put something in place that would erase the work of his son on the cross. Amen. There's no law that can give life. When the Mosaic covenant was given, everyone was already under sin. The covenant of works was already broken. The covenant of works has already been broken by all in Adam and all in our own personal sin. And listen, 
The very fact that there is a sacrificial system put in place in the Mosaic Covenant presupposes sin and is a gracious act by God. So as we talked about last time, the Mosaic Covenant was a covenant of preparation to prepare Israel for Jesus, to keep their mind set on the hope that they have in the promised one to come in Genesis 3 and through Abraham. But the fact that the Mosaic Covenant was misused to be a system of righteousness is a reality. Paul says in Romans 10, 1 through 3, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. For Speaking of ethnic Israel, for I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. As I said last time, it's easy to find self-righteousness when you're downplaying the law. Right? Which is why Jesus comes on the scene and he heightens the view of the law. And he says, you know what? It's not just looking at, I mean, it's not just the physical act of adultery. If you're looking with lust, you've committed sin in your heart. It's not just uh, bearing or, or uh, excuse me, coveting something or stealing the act of stealing, excuse me. It's if you're, if you're coveting, Paul says that in Romans 7. It's, it's actually wanting that with a lustful heart that's sin. The problem that ethnic Israel in general had was that they abandoned God's purpose for the Mosaic Covenant and started seeing it as a system of being righteous on their own in God's eyes. Paul says that here in Romans 10. They looked at the Mosaic Covenant as an alternative route to the promises. And that's what Paul's arguing against here in Galatians. It's not an alternative route. It's a preparation for the only route, which is Jesus. Amen. The Mosaic Covenant was a temporary covenant of preparation until the promised Messiah arrived is what Paul's telling us here. And it was inferior to the promises given to Abraham, which is, you know, you, you read this, this statement here in, in verse 19 and 20, and you you know, you kind of like, what is, what, is, what is Paul saying that for, right? Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made, and it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. What was put in place? The Mosaic Covenant. It was put in place by angels, through angels, by an intermediary. That mediator was Moses. Mo Moses was the mediator of that covenant. So angels put it in place through an intermediary. That intermediary intermediary mediator was Moses but the promise didn't come through a mediator and it didn't come through angels the promise came from God himself and so Paul says this kind of odd statement to show the inferior nature of the Mosaic covenant to the covenant given to Abraham the promises given to Abraham which is a restatement of the promises in Genesis 3 which is the covenant of grace Now, Paul explains this in greater detail here by giving a human example to give us a basic understanding of a covenant. And you, you see that here in verse 3, in verse 15, he says, To give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. Right? Once it's been agreed upon, you can't negate a man-made covenant. We know that, don't we? I mean, we, we, have, uh, we have 7,500 page contracts. And Paul brings our minds to the elemental components of a covenant, and he's saying, he's giving us ex this example of how even a man made covenant binds us, binds us, and binds the participants of that man-made covenant to each other when a covenant is made. Now, where are you getting at, Paul? Why, what, are you, what are you saying? Why are you doing this? What Paul is saying is because even in the fallen sinful world, it is understood that it is wrong to go against or break a covenant. Right? Right? 
You go break a promise to somebody at work and see how they treat you. Go breach an agreement with your, with your boss and see how it goes for you. Try living in your house and not making your mortgage payment and see how that goes for you. Try driving that car around while not making payments on it and see how long you have it. What Paul's saying is even in a fallen sinful world, we see how binding a covenant is and how wrong it is to break that covenant. And there are severe consequences if you break a covenant or go against it. You cannot ignore or reject an agreement once it has been agreed upon in a fallen world. And if that is true, Paul's saying, between fallen human beings, how much more a holy God who cannot tell a lie. Now, I want to I draw a little bit of attention here to this, what Paul is saying here. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read Hebrews 6, 13 through 17. We could go back to Genesis, but for time's sake, I'm just going to read Hebrews 6, verse 13 through 17. For when God made a promise to Abraham, he had no one greater by whom to swear. He swore by himself saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abram, Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes an oath is final for confirmation. So when God, God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. Now, I don't want us to pass over the importance of what I just read. What, what we're told here, what Paul's telling us here in Galatians and what the author of Hebrews is telling us and what we see um, illustrated in Genesis when God makes this promise to Abraham, what we're seeing is, is that God is putting himself in the contract. Amazing. An amazing thing. Well, how, how do I know, Lord? I'll tell you how sure this is, Abraham, and to all the heirs of the promise, which Paul tells us here are those who are of what? Faith. Here's how sure this promise is. I'm going to put myself in the covenant. It's going to be a covenant between me. I'm going to speak more to that next week. It wasn't, well, you know, I mean, like we do, I'll, I'll lay my mortgage on the line, right? I'll, I'll, may, I'll lay my house. If I don't pay for this house, if I stop paying for the house, you can have it back, right? That's, that's the kind of covenant we have with the banks, right, for our homes. If, if, if I don't keep paying on this car, then you, you take it back. It wasn't that. This promise of redemption... This covenant of grace is so important to God that God says this promise is so, so sure that I'm putting my own life on the line in this contract. It's amazing. God, God, this is God saying this is such a sure promise that I put my own life as the surety. If I don't keep this, this promise, Abraham, if I don't keep this promise, heirs of the promise, may my life be ripped to shreds. May I be killed. May, my, may I lose my life if I don't keep this promise. Now, that sounds like a pretty sure promise to me. Amen. That the eternal God who has always existed, who cannot tell a lie, says, this is so sure that I'm putting my own life within the oath. And dear Christian, this is the confidence that we have of our redemption. Is it not a beautiful thing? I, I'm, I'm, I'm holding back from going into next week's sermon. <laughs> 
This is the confidence and the assurance that we have of our redemption in Jesus Christ. And within that promise that God gives to Abraham is the promise of the Spirit, which does a work in us, does he not? We're told that he, the Holy Spirit is given to every believer at the moment of salvation, and the Holy Spirit seals them, keeps them, binds them into the covenant, which is the guarantee of our inheritance. For God to do such a thing, you talk about bending over backwards to make a point. It's, it's, it's a beautiful picture of the mercy and grace of God towards, towards people, towards his creatures. I mean, God could have. He could have said, Abraham, I'll tell you why you can believe it. Because I am said it. Enough. But God in his, his abounding grace and his abounding mercy said, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what, Abraham, here's what I'm going to do so that, so that you're confident. I'm going to put myself in the oath. And if, if I don't make it happen, may I die. No, nothing is going to come between God and keeping that promise. That's what God says. That promise is as sure as my life. It's as sure as my being. It's as sure as I am the great I am. And it will come by promise and nothing else. Which is what Paul says and why he says in verse 17 and 18, this is what I mean, the law which came 430 years afterward does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. God's not going to put his life on the line and then annul it by something else. Verse 18, for if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise, but God gave it to Abraham by a promise upon himself that it would come by promise. So further explanation Paul gives us here that God did not give the Mosaic covenant to do away with the covenant of grace expressed through the promises to Abraham. God gave the Mosaic covenant to support and prepare the way of the promised seed who would fulfill all that was necessary for the promises to be kept. Amen? Amen. I mean, you look at, you look at John 17. I, I'm getting into next week's sermon, but you look at John 17. Father, I did what you gave me to do. I accomplished the mission you gave me to do. I did everything that was necessary for the promises to be inherited, to come on our people. More to, more to say for next time, I guess, but how beautiful is this? We have this covenant of grace in Genesis 3 that is unfolding as we progress through the Old Testament and into the New. We're being given more clarity of how it will be brought to fulfillment. We're given more clarity to the mercies that God put into place for the Messiah to come, right? Every, every action we see is just more mercy and more grace on God's part to prepare the world for the coming of his son so that the promises all the way back in Genesis 3 are yes and amen in Jesus Christ. The lengths that God has gone to to ensure the promises are kept and to ensure that the people of God receive the Messiah. So I want to want to close with with just us thinking on how when we when we think of this covenant, this promise that was made by God, and how sure it is. How confident we can be! How confident we can be in this.
this redemption, this salvation promised by God all the way back in Genesis 3 and unfolded with greater revelation as we go through the Bible and then we burst into the scenes in the New Testament and what the gospel writers are saying, here he is, this is him. This is the one promised all the way back in Genesis 3. This is the seed of Abraham, says Matthew. Luke says, not only the seed of Abraham, but the seed of Adam. Which is why they each take their genealogies to different points. Because Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world, and he is calling people out from the world, from every tribe and tongue and nation to be his people. So let us rejoice, dear friend, in the surety of our redemption. Amen? Amen. Let us rejoice in the absolute faithfulness of God in spite of the unfaithfulness of us. And let us rejoice in the long suffering of God and the redemption of his people. Romans 11:33 Oh the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God how unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. Amen. Amen. Glory to God that the promise of salvation isn't based on me keeping anything, but, but Christ, the eternal Son of God, the Holy Spirit, and God the Father keeping their promise, and God saying, it's so sure that I'll put my life on the line. And I'll, I'll say more about that next week. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we come to you this morning just absolutely in awe. That, that first, that you would want to save us, rebels, sinners, haters of you before salvation. We were at enmity with you. That you would not only want to, but you would be willing to, and that you would carry it out. All the work of God, all the work of your hand, What grace, what grace we, we find in the covenant of grace and in your dealings with humanity, the long suffering and the mercy and the grace that you have poured out towards your creation and especially towards your people. And Lord, I pray that it would stir our hearts to absolute love for you and love for each other. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for redemption. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for Jesus Christ. Thank you for our groom. And oh, how we along that great wedding feast that is to come. And that you will clothe us in bodies that cannot sin, that cannot suffer, and that can express their gratitude in sinlessness. We, we long for that day and we say, come Lord Jesus. And we pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen.